Well, we're back with another Nine Old Men episode, specifically part two in the life of John Lounsbury. Last episode, we looked at the beginning of his career at Disney and how his affinity for animating duos really shows why he's a legendary animator, but he still has a bit to go before he reaches his zenith of creativity. So let's take a look. Before we start, don't forget to check out our Discord, our coffee page, and like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell, all the things. It really helps us out. When last we left John, he had just finished animating Br'er Bear and Fox in the Song of the South. But if you think our boy is going to stop drawing wild animals there, we've got a giant surprise for you. In Fun and Fancy Free, he animated the lion's share of Willy the Giant. Cause I know the magic word is five, four, fee, 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 fee. I don't know no fee, fee. The giant's expressions are solid and show the thoughts going through his head. Unlike, say, a corgi. Ah, nothing going on behind those eyes. On Melody Time, John mostly focused on the sequence Blame It on the Samba, which shows the animator's extraordinary ability to animate great dance scenes. There is something about the beat you cling to, not the type of song you sing to, but the kind of thing you swing to. When you get to bouncing with the beat in your feet, for when you bounce and do the beat you reel in, with the karaoke feeling, but if you want to hit the ceiling, here is all you have to do. And how did that look? Ten! He also contributed a bit to Once Upon a Winter Time, mostly done by Eric Larson, as well as a scene for the toughest critter west of the Alamo, Pecos Bill, which was led by Milt Call and Ward Kimball. Next came Ichabod and Mr. Toad, where he animated on the Sleepy Hollow sequence, particularly in the scene where Ichabod is laughing at the weeds. <laughs> It was Cinderella, Disney's triumphant return to major animated films that had one continuous story that showed the great range and versatility Lounsbury had as an animator and draftsman. Not only did he animate a lot of Major the Horse and Bruno the Dog, which are more traditional Disney-style animals, but also did quite a bit of the mice, including Jack singing the working song. Every time she find a minute, that's the time when they begin it. Cinderella, Cinderella, Cinderella! As well as all of the animals in the transformation scene. You just can't keep the man from his animals. But hey, we aren't complaining. But instead of a horse, you're the coachman, of course. Bing, bang, boom. Why, we'll have a coach and four when we're through. Just a wave of my stick and to finish the trick. Bimity, bumity, boom. Gracious, what did I do? Sadly, John's contributions and animation in Cinderella had gone almost completely unnoticed and unrecognized by the animation community, as has his work in many other films. Ward Kimball has been given credit for doing almost all of the mice, and even though he did indeed do a lot of the characters, he didn't do as much as has been claimed. John also did a few scenes with Lucifer the Cat, a character which many people have given Kimball sole credit for. Thievery in the arts. The most heinous of crimes. Right, Butch Hartman? <laughs> the next film, Alice in Wonderland, is another film that Lounsbury did great work on that has gone largely unnoticed. He was the lead animator on The Rose in the scenes with the flowers. Dang, he probably missed drawing animals. Wait, what's that? He was also the one who actually did the majority of the scenes with the Cheshire Cat? The Cheshire Cat is another character oftentimes exclusively credited to Ward, but even though he designed the character and supervised him, John did a lot of the best work on the character. The solidity of drawing he did on the character as well as his broad, clear facial expressions and mysterious personality is particularly excellent and has made his work on the character a personal Disney favorite for us. 
On Peter Pan, John Lounsbury did a phenomenal job animating all of George Darling, the strict and temperamental but ultimately loving father of the Darling children, and forever cemented the classic bit. This is my last clean. No. Ah, classic. Three absolutely must studies for any animator who wants to know a grain of rice about cartoon acting. One is where George is in a stern, strict way talking to Wendy about how she needs to grow up and move out of the nursery. It's high time she had a room of her own. Oh, sure. What? No. I mean it. Young lady, this is your last night in the nursery. And that's my last word on the matter. Doof. Doof. Another is the one where he registers what Wendy is saying when she explains what happened. No, what, Mary? <laughs> Nana, did you see? <laughs> you know, I have the strangest feeling that I've seen that ship before. A long time ago. The last is while George is walking down the street with his wife. He goes into huge freakout sessions about Peter Pan. Oh, Peter Pan. Peter Pan? You don't say. Goodness gracious, whatever shall we do? But George, Sound the alarm. Really Call Scotland Yard. There must have been someone. He seems to be himself scared to death about even the thought of the name Peter Pan. Here, John uses broad acting and exaggerated poses and movements to show the strong emotions of fear George has towards anything related to Peter Pan. It is... Mwah. It would be the next film, though, where John would show he really could take his animation to the very highest level of excellence and give a performance that is still known as one of the greatest in Disney animation history, and that film is Lady and the Tramp. On Lady, John Lounsbury got a rare opportunity to use all his strengths to the best level. He got to animate the heated argument between the enforcing policeman and the intellectual minding his own business professor in front of the zoo. He's not my dog. Oh, he's not, go, eh? Go away. Get down. Go on. Why, certainly not, officer. Why, I suppose you'll be telling me next it was the dog that was whistling, eh? I'm certain I don't know. Oh, so I'm a liar now, am I? Well, you listen to me. Bull the Bulldog, who is locked up in the pound, and most significantly, Tony and Joe, the Italian owner and cook at Tony's Italian restaurant. Lounsbury's animation is flawless, states Andreas Deja. Those were wonderful, broad characters, stated John Pomeroy in awe. So great and Italian looking, you could smell them on the screen. I used to pull out and look at his rough drawings. All I could say was, God, that's the way I want to draw. John not only gives the Italians outstanding caricature and design, but his performance shows a brilliant understanding of personality, character contrast, and character relationship. Hmm, humans, the animals of the bipedal world, a John Lounsbury specialty. Tony is a passionate, bold, and romantic leader who makes his strong emotions very clear, while Joe is the more contained cook who does what he is told without hesitation and is very happy-go-lucky. Highlights include the scene where Tony explains the importance of the night, and that the canine couple is going to get the best in the house. Here's your bones, Tony. Okay, bones. Bones? What's the matter for you, Joe? I break your face. Tonight, the butcher, he's going to get the best in the house. Okay, Tony, you're the boss. As well as the one where Tony says in response to Joe saying dogs don't talk, Ah, uh, he's uh, talking to me. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Hey, Joe. Butcher, he says he wants two spaghetti speciale, heavy on the mitzvah. Tony, dogs don't talk. He's a talker to me. Okay, he's a talker to you. You the boss. Mamma mia, manger, you can never see the These two scenes both show the intense passion Lounsbury gave Tony, and are also great examples of strong, exaggerated, and expressive poses that show what the character is feeling, who he is and has the action support those two things. Sleeping Beauty proved to be another significant film in Lounsbury's career because it shows a significant change in his style. While before he drew and animated largely in a cartoony but solid style in line with animators such as Ward Kimball, in this film he began to have a reputation as the best guy at the studio who could follow the artistic direction the Disney films were going, aka Milt Call style. 
With the exception of Mark Davis, who even Call considered an incredible draftsman and always designed his own characters, animators like Kimball, Titla, Fred Moore, Fergie, and Wooly were pretty independent from Call's style and didn't ask him for drawings. By the time Sleeping Beauty came around, those animators had left the studio or moved into a different department, allowing Milt to design almost all of the Disney characters in the way he wanted to. Sort of just jumping right into a Closing Doors opening, huh? Lounsbury was the one who could tackle the change in the styling of Disney films Milt planned, explained the great Andreas Deja. It was difficult for Frank and Ollie to take to certain abstract shapes. Lounsbury had an easier time with that because of the natural draftsman he was. On Sleeping Beauty, Lounsbury animated a lot of Samson, a character designed by Milt Call, as well as a bit of Milt's Prince Philip, an assignment that Call himself didn't have much fondness for. He also animated Maleficent's Goons, another great Lounsbury design and performance, the owl in the Once Upon a Dream sequence, and the two kings. Well, it, it uh, may come as quite a shock. <laughs> shock? My Philip a shock? What's wrong with my Philip? Nothing, Hubert. I only meant... Why doesn't your daughter like my son? Now, now. I'm not so sure my son likes your daughter. Now, see here. I'm not so sure my grandchildren want you for a grandfather. Why, you, you unreasonable, uh, pompous, uh, blustering uh, old windbag. Uh, unreasonable, pompous, uh, unguard, sir. I warn you, Hubert. This means war. Forward, for honor, for country. <laughs> and once again, we have to stop before we finish John's story, which includes some of our favorite work of his. So stay tuned. We'll be here singing while you wait. On this lovely Thank you to these people for supporting us on Patreon and Coffee. And if you want to make sure this channel sticks around, you can check out our Coffee link in the description. Every bit helps. Thank you for watching this episode of Disographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it. And if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked below. We hope to see you in another discography. <laughs>